Good afternoon, or is it evening yet? Good evening, good evening. Thanks everyone for being here, welcome. I'm Janice Price, I'm the CEO of the Luminato Festival. And we are now in day three of this, our eighth festival, hard to believe for many of us. Um, and we've already witnessed just an amazing and captivating array of performances and events. I hope some of you have been out to some other of, of our many shows already. Um, one of the touchstones of the festival is transformation. And over the course of the next 10 days, the city will witness a transformation for sure of our public spaces, our parks, our theaters, and more. So we are welcoming artists from all over the world and featuring a range of Canadian, North American, and international premieres. So today you have an opportunity to find out more about some of the motivation and the inspiration uh, of the legendary actress, filmmaker, writer, and model, Isabella Rossellini. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Welcome, Isabella. <laughs> the talk today will be moderated by our esteemed colleague from the New York Times, Sam Sifton, and some of you have been lucky enough to see one of the three performances of Green Porno. That is the uh, show that Isabella is presenting at Luminato. It is truly a charming and magical show, so I know that she and Sam will have some discussion about that today, as well as her uh, really amazing career. Working with the New York Times has allowed this and other Times talks that we're doing through the festival to reach larger audiences through insightful discussions with leading artists who are appearing at this year's festival. And of course, events such as these would not be possible without all of you coming and supporting us, so thank you for being here. There's still many more Illuminato Festival events to come, so if you are ready to be inspired or challenged by the arts, please join us at another event between now and June 15th. We are now, we are very proud and honored to have been selected to partner with the New York Times and its prestigious Times Talk series of insightful discussions. So please join me now in welcoming Carol Day of the New York Times. Thank you, Janice. And thank you everyone for being here. It's great to be working with Luminato, everyone at the festival, and the citizens of Toronto to bring Times Talks to the festival. We're delighted to have these Times Talks Luminato programs live on timestalks.com. This evening, as Janet said, as Janice said, we are so excited to have such a distinguished and internationally acclaimed actress with us. It's truly thrilling and you'll hear much more about her and her work from our moderator. He has had many important roles at the New York Times, including senior editor, culture editor, restaurant critic, and national editor. I can't think of anybody better to interview tonight's guests. So please join me in welcoming Sam Sifton and our very special guest, Isabella Rossellini. feel good. Oh, God. <laughs> Thank you, Isabella, for uh, agreeing to sit and talk with the New York Times. It's, um, it's a pleasure to meet you on stage and backstage. We will uh, talk for a while, mm -hmm. and then, uh, if it's OK with you, we'll take a few questions from our uh, audience. So you had the Canadian premiere of Green Porno live yes. on stage on yes. Friday night. <laughs> Uh, I was there last night. Um, it was marvelous. I was Thank struck uh, 
by the aesthetic of the stage performance and how it differs from the green pornos that we have seen online and how much more kind of intimate and academic it is. And I use academic in the very best sense of the word. It may have been the grandeur of the Winter Garden Theater. It may have been your glasses. <laughs> But um, I felt at times that we were witnessing uh, what in a novel would be one of those great moments of a 19th century lecturer, uh, the greatest, smartest person of the age lecturing the crowd and everyone <laughs> with applause as you gave her coming in. Can you talk a little bit about what it was that you set out to do with Green well, Corner Well, you know, I think that, um, that tone uh, might be due to Jean-Claude Carrière. Jean-Claude Carrière is an incredible, wonderful French writer who wrote for Louis Bournuel, who works with Peter Brook, and he helped me put together the monologue. Because I'm not a writer, and uh, I made these short films about animals as comical little things. And a friend of mine, Carole Bouquet, a French actress, came up with the idea of doing a monologue. And I said, Carol, I, I, I wrote two minutes film. How do I go from a two minutes film to a, a monologue? And she thought about it for a while. And she said, because she was in one of the Bourneuil films, she said, I'm going to call Jean-Claude. And we had lunch, and Jean-Claude accepted. So I think that uh, more uh, lecture tone, or the fact that he's a little bit more intellectual than Green Porno, is due to the brain of Jean-Claude Carrière. I don't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> you start the show with a brilliant gambit. You may have seen this. Uh, you walk on stage with two bouquets. And, and you speak about the sexual reproduction of plants. Yes. And grasses, as we know, depend on the wind to carry their seed. Uh, some flowers, on the other hand, depend on getting bees to, to come and carry the, the nectar around. They're very sexualized, as Georgia O'Keeffe showed us. Right? Yes. Then you throw them to the ground, <laughs> and we move into the, into the world of, of animal reproduction. Um, these flowers, these sexualized flowers, we, we, we give them, you said last night, to popes. Yes. We put them in churches. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about why it is you think that we have this strange relationship on the one hand, with animal reproduction, which we're a little nervous talking about in public. It's too close to us. Oh, yeah. boy. And then um, these, flowers. these flowers. But of course, seduction must have a common denominator, because we are seduced by flowers, who are colorful and perfumed and you know, strange shape of petal. And they are there to seduce bees and other pollinators. Um, so we are, I think, very sensitive to all kind of seduction, and it probably is a long history of it. And it's still, we feel attracted to flowers more than grasses, uh, because grasses, they don't have to seduce any person. They just rely on the wind, who cannot be seduced. Grasses are a specialty item. Yes. <laughs> you also say in the show, you have a moment, it's great because it insults the press, and I love those moments, um, saying that, you know, that inevitably comes this question from the media, you know, which one of these animals do you... Yes, because they want to know my, about my sexual life. Yeah, I don't. No. <laughs> I'm not... I am not here to ask about that. The New York Times is not that kind of newspaper. We are in a whole different world. But I do want to know who your favorite animal is. <laughs> well, I don't know. Um, they are so, you know, they're, they're, I really have to say that is the diversity that is interesting. Because I, when I do my films or I do my monologue, I can contrast an animal uh, with another. Because their sexual preferences or their way of raising their offspring or their uh, seduction strategies are so different. So my entire uh, films or monologues is built on diversity. If it wasn't diversity and they all made love like us, I don't think I would have matière. I don't have enough uh, to write about. So it really is the diversity. But some of the films I think that we've done uh, are, I prefer certain films to others. And I just think this is due to the art direction. You know, we, um, it takes a long time to try to figure out these costumes. I don't know if you've, all of you have seen my films, but they have very elaborate costume where I transform myself into an animal. And um, th those are very difficult to, to, to make. 
and some are better than others. Some uh, come apart, <laughs> some are easier to wear than others. The hardest one to wear was the earthworm, which was the simplest one to make. We made a series of r pink rings, only that it was 30 feet long, and I didn't have the arms for the entire day. And you know, your nose scratches, you have hair, you can't do anything. I, and then I also, I was flat on the floor, <laughs> and the camera couldn't see me, so they say, can you come up a little bit? So I was on a crunch, just a little bit to favor the camera, and no arms, and no legs, of course. The earth one was the worst. <laughs> Life is terrible for an earth form. I think that's, I think that's true. Uh, they can regenerate, however, right? Yes, they can. They, if they, they have segments, and uh, at, you can cut them at a certain segment. And, and after that, they don't. Re, they don't. But you can, if you cut them at the right segment, they can become two. How lucky is that? They are lucky. It's tough in other ways. Yes. For the earthworm, the yeah. poor earthworm. I talked to Andy Byers, who yes. worked with you on, oh, on, yeah. on the costumes. And he told me a, a very interesting thing, which was that and, and they are marvelously inventive and, yeah. and, and I will say simple, because they need to be simple um, to read, costumes. And he says, well, you know, that many of them came just from drawings that Bella gave me. Yeah. Is this well, so? The, Can you talk yes. a little bit well, about when that? I, when, I write the, when I write the script, I draw them. Mm -hmm. I draw because it's too simple to say I'm a fly, so I fly off and I'm, I'm on the wall upside down, and then delegate the others to do it. So I write and I draw so that I also create a visual continuity, and I give some of the basic, essential solution of my costumes. But of course, Andy Bayer and Rick uh, Gilbert, who also works with me in, in the theater. Um, come up with so many details and make it so fun, um, that is wonderful. The second group of films that we did, we tried to change the name from Green Porno because we couldn't find a sponsor. The sponsor said, we love your film, we'll pay for it, but we can't do it with the name Porno. I said, no problem, we'll change the name. So I did a whole new series about seduction, we called Seduce Me. The sponsor didn't come anyway. But in, in Seduce Me, we had a bigger budget. And so those costumes were extraordinary. Those is the dolphin, the duck. In my monologue, I show those. So we not only have costume, but we also have sets. And those are pretty. And then the, really, Andy and Rick went crazy. On well, those. the dolphins are a little racy. I, if you haven't, the, I mean, <laughs> the doll, uh, there's some porno to the, to the, the dolphins. Because they do anything. Yeah, they, they, the, anything goes, we'll, I say, with the dolphins. We'll, we'll, <laughs> co we'll, we'll come back to the dolphins. There, there's much to discuss with the, with the dolphins. But I'm curious about, this, uh, about the move from, um, from the films to the stage. You are, in both settings, very funny. And on stage, um, is introduced uh, a technique that you don't use in the films and that works exceedingly well on stage, which is what we call in America prop comedy, uh, yeah. right? Or, uh, where the things get thrown all over when they are discarded. And it works quite, where did that come from? That came actually from Muriel Mayet, who direct, gave me five days to direct the monologue. She is the uh, director of the Comédie Française that was founded you know, in 1600. She's the first woman who to run that institution. She's an actress. And she, when she was little, she, um, she was the girl that went, ta-da, because her grandfather was a magician. And so when he finished the trick, she was the girl in the bathing suit that went, ta-da, <laughs> you know. And then from that, she became an actress, a director, and now she runs the Comédie Française. And uh, Muriel is very fast and, uh, and, so she, and also very busy. So she gave me five days. But she, for example, we had a podium like this, a very simple, normal podium, where I was uh, you know, reading or following my monologue. And she made that podium into also a kind of a little theater where it opens up and I can do puppet show and I bring things out from behind, so throwing things on the floor. So it was just her idea. It was nothing. It was just two or three things that added so much j z zany. Uh, I was so lucky to be able to work with Jean-Claude Carrière and to, with Muriel Mayette because they gave me so much. The, the zany is 
absolutely crucial to the success yes. of it, I, th yes. I, I think. Um, as we talk about um, what led to the stage play, I want to go to what led to green porno in, in the first place, or may have gone to green, led to green porno in the first place. I don't know how many of you in the audience are familiar with um, the film My Dad is 100 Years Old. Yes. It's a marvelous film that Isabella made in 2005? In 2005. We shot it in 2005 to be ready in 2006, that would have been the centennial of my father's uh, uh, anniversary. It would have been 100 years old in uh, 2006. And there were major retrospective of his work. And so I thought that I would make a film, um, because a lot of people ask me to give interview or talk about my parents. My father it was a filmmaker, Roberto Rossellini. My mother is an actress, Ingrid Bergman. And so I thought that for my father's centennial, I would make a, a, a film. And when I was working with Canadian director Guy Madden, I thought that I could borrow Guy Madden aesthetic. Now, Guy makes his film in black and white. It looked like old silent movies, all you know, scratched and all ruined, a little bit like my father's film after his death started to look like. It was the beginning of the campaign to film, to restore film, to conserve film, as we conserve painting, as we conserve sculpture. But there was a period where I was witnessing the work of my father's fading away. And, and Guy uh, caught that aesthetic, caught that feeling of fading, of disappearing in his film, which makes them so poetic. And so when I was worrying, working with Guy, I thought I should borrow his aesthetic to make this film about my father and this fear of, of losing your dad. Not only is dead, but now his memory of the sharing with other people, my children. The only thing my children didn't meet their grandparents. They were dead by the time I had my children. The only thing I can do is to show them their films, their photo, but their film shows them their talent, their head, what he was in their head. And so I borrowed Guy's aesthetic to make My Dad is 100 Years, to give this feeling of, of uh, fear of, uh, but it's also a comedy. I mean, it's a 20 minutes film where I play all directors. I play Hitchcock, Charlie Chaplin, Fellini. I play everybody. Everybody, you play your mother. <laughs> I play my mom. <laughs> it, it's a marvelous film. And there is a moment in it when um, it is, I suppose it's your father saying that his films are motivated by the need to know. And I thought that was so important. And then at the very end of the film, of course, at the end of his life, he is making nature films, science yes. films yes. with you, sending you to the med <laughs> to pull these sea urchins come and then bring them back and, and, and mix their, their eggs and milk together to see what happens. They die. Um, <laughs> but an idea was born. Can you talk a little bit about how the, the, that sort of final idea of your father's you know, it plays was into after, this? Yes, I, do, I didn't realize that my interest in science might have come from my father. Of course, my father made this film that were called Neorealism right after the war. And he, these films look like documentaries, but they are not documentaries. They are very realistic. And it was a real revolution in film style. And, uh, he always got very irritated when people talked about his film styles, as calling it neorealism, because he said neorealism is the need to know, is to use film, this technique, not only to entertain, distract, but to also witness, so he could show you how the civilian in Italy lived the war. Um, and so he continued uh, in this, uh, trying to use films as a, knowledge, as a tool of knowledge, until at the end of his life, he wanted to make films about science. And so I was sent to pick up a sea urchin, what we cut, and we took the, the sperm and the eggs and trying to mix it, because he was experimenting in the kitchen how to film it. And they die, you know, they were <laughs> die. But so it was enough for him to see what camera, what lens, what lights. But I don't know that it was that, that I was always interested in science, but it was my dad. I was always interested in animal behavior in particular. And it was my dad that, when I was 14 year old, gave me the book by Conrad Lawrence, uh, The King, King Salomon's Ring. Conrad Lawrence was the founder of the science of animal behavior etology and won a Nobel Prize for it. He did most of his studying before the war and also a little bit after. But um, uh, when I read that book, what was his biography, uh, it's almost like a lamp bulb went out in my head, and I said, this is what I want to do. And when I was 14, 
I thought that I was going to make films about animals. And, uh, but uh, there were two things. I think now there were several things that you know, didn't lead me there. One was that etology was a very new science. And though it, it, it was taught in England, where there is a long tradition of animal studies, and maybe some in America, but it wasn't taught in Italy. So when I tried to go to school, it was only veterinary school or agrarian. It wasn't animal behavior. Um, then there were the fantastic documentary by David Attenborough, BBC, Natural Geographic, Nova. I said, they are doing it. They don't need me. Then, of course, uh, I was pretty, so I became a model. So that took me into a completely different world that I loved, but was far from the world of animals. And it was funny that, you know, as I stopped modeling and even worked less as an actress, I went back to this childhood right. dream, and by then, all the university caught on, caught on in the and ethology, the conservation, and had the classes. So I went back to university, and I made my film. And I thought, you know what, National Geographic, they're never funny, funny. I, an animal make me laugh. I'm going to make films about how animals make me laugh. And that's why they became these comical short films about animals. <laughs> that's a sweet story. This is the saga. <laughs> So those are, we, did, we did some heady questions. We delved into the past. Um, I'd, I wonder if you wouldn't mind stopping and playing just a short, little short word game. Oh. Um, I'll, I'll give you some names. OK. Oh, I hope I got, oh. And you respond Now you see this. I'm very ignorant. You'll know the names. OK. We just want you to <laughs> respond as candidly as you can. OK. okay. This is kind of off the record. <laughs> Um, but if you want to expand upon the name, that would, that would be great. I, we'd be pleased. Are you, okay. are you ready okay, to play? Okay, I'm ready. Okay. Robert Redford. Oh, Robert Redford. Oh, Thank okay. you. Okay. Okay. This is, uh, no, you no, know. No, no. We're going um, to the next oh, game. We're okay. going to the next okay, game. Okay. We got that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's Michelle the best. Michelle Obama. Oh, Michelle Obama, I love. She is beautiful, she's powerful, she's modern. You know, I cannot tell you, I was thinking about it today. I don't know why. I think my, why, because, I know why. Because my stepmother was from India and she died two days ago. And uh, my family was incredibly mixed. We grew up with, you know, my mom was from Sweden, so we were blonde and blue eye. And then some of my brothers and sister were dark skin, wearing saris. And maybe today's is not, there is more mixed family, but in the 60s in Italy, uh, where we didn't have then a problem of migration, it was, uh, we would look so different and so strange than anybody. And I remember when Obama was elected, uh, still today, I, I, I feel like uh, crying, the power, the image of seeing a black president with a black family walking in the White House, uh, you know, I remember that my brothers and sisters, you know, they never saw dark skin. It was always white that was powerful, that was receiving awards, uh, um, that were the people that had power. That image was so strong to me. And I remember becoming so moved for my brothers and sister, and also my son, Roberto, who is black. Uh, so. Um, you know, of course, when I looked at Michelle Obama, I think well, she gave me a gift that she may not know. Just that image to have the first lady being black is such a blessing. Robert Maplethorpe. Oh, yeah. I worked with him. We're going left. No, we're, we're going, going right. So Robert Maplethorpe, I'll tell you one thing about Robert Maplethorpe. You know, I saw that is, uh, I don't know if you can call it, well, sadomasochistic uh, photo. I don't know how you want to call it, pornographic sadomasochistic. Well, sold at a Saddleby for, I don't know, like $50,000. And the portrait of me, just like this, just simple portrait, no nudity, 5000 <laughs> I've noticed that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sex sells, <laughs> thus green porno. That's right. <laughs> Pope Francis. Pope Francis, you know, is very loved in Italy. Uh, it, you, know, he, he, you know, even the atheists love St. Francis. Uh, 
Um, so, you know, I don't have, I don't know, if I live in Rome, uh, or when I go back to Rome, I'm going to Rome tomorrow, then I would have a feel. But even my most atheist, uh, uh, even sometime in Italy, we have communists, they still like this pope. Everybody likes this pope. Everybody likes this pope. Likes this pope. It's very different from the last pope. And everybody likes St. Francis. It's, you know, St. Francis in Italy is, the, is a saint that transcends religion for some reason. <laughs> and so his pope. Speaking of religion, Madonna. Oh, Madonna. <laughs> <laughs> different sort of Ma religion. Madonna, yes. I, I, I was in her books, in the sex book. Yes. I was with her in the sex book. And I told her, I don't want to be doing any nudity. She said, no, no, I just want to shampoo your hair. <laughs> and there is sensuality on that. I said, OK, you can shampoo my hair. So we did the photo. But she didn't shampoo my hair, but we played around on the beach chasing each other. And they were beautiful photos. She worked with photographer Stephen Meisel, who's a fantastic fashion photographer. And Stephen didn't want to do, like old fashioned photographer, a book that is a collection of these photos that appeared in fashion magazine, and thought with Madonna to do a book about sex, and, uh, and because it's such an interesting subject. And I thought, yeah, of course, you're right, that it makes sense. But when I saw the book, actually, I wasn't moved by it. Because I think that Madonna is too athletic. She took care of her body too much. And so it was almost like when you see um, uh, an athlete in underwear, it's not the same thing if you see a businessman in underwear. <laughs> a businessman in underwear gives you right a punch, like, oh my god, what is that? An athlete, <laughs> and I think her body was too athletic. It, it, the book doesn't have that sexuality that shocks you or, or moves you or frightens you. It, it, it was just aesthetic. That is a fantastic answer. Oh, really? It really okay. is. <laughs> I hadn't thought of it that way. That's absolutely great. <laughs> Alfred Hitchcock. Hitchcock was a wonderful friend of my mom. And my mom, every time she said Hitch, that's how she called him, her eyes would sparkle. And I think they had many laughs. And he was very, very funny. When I, I only met him once. Uh, when he was very old, and in fact, I even thought he wasn't unconscious. <laughs> uh, because he was sitting on a chair, like frozen, and everybody was talking, and he didn't react to anything, and his eyes seemed lost. And I was, you know, I felt really bad. And then uh, I said, I said uh, you know, we were leaving, and we said goodbye, and he said, kid, never get arrested. It's <laughs> terrible to get arrested. That's what happened to me when I was a little boy. My father had me arrested for one day, and since then it influenced my entire life. And in a flash, I understood his films. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. The, so he was completely conscious, but he was f and very funny. And yeah. I could understand why my mom had this. So it was this, uh, you know, English, you know, no expression. Yeah, yeah. very dead. <laughs> no emotion. Bad. His argument with your father in, da in 100 years is, is just great. Yes. You, you do a very good Hitchcock, uh, <laughs> I should say. Hillary Clinton. I'll vote for her. In a flash, I want her to be there. I want her to be running first. I hope she makes a decision. Charlie Chaplin. Uh, my god. Yes. And my dad's God, too. My father was not a fan of Hollywood. You know, he made films that were considered anti-Hollywood and, and never had a photo signed by anybody, never had that kind of memorabilia. But he did have a photo of Charlie Chaplin on his desk. Let's yeah. stick with Chaplin for a okay. moment. Because I think um, his influence is, is clear, I think, in, in Green Porno. Yeah, uh, in my can, film, yeah. Can I, you talk about that a little bit, about the, oh, yeah. the role that the Chaplin plays in your, in your career, let's well, say. Well, there's two things that play in my films. Silent movie, um, because I realized that if you look at Georges Méliès, who started to make films uh, you know, in 1901, um, he had a very clunky camera that didn't move. And the camera was placed, and uh, sometimes they might move it to make a little close-up, but he was never you know, side corner, reverse shot, above shot. And I got very intimidated as a director how to move the camera and the technology, and I don't know anything. And yet, when I look at Georges Méliès or Silent Movie, 
they are as fun as an entertaining, and yet they don't have all this intricate camera mm -hmm. movement. So I decided that I was going to study that style and take it on for my work. So my films, everything is like stage. You know, the camera is here and goes, you know, sometimes it comes closer, sometimes it's wider, but I never do a reverse shot. There's never anything complicated. And I can see that you can make humor because you have a frame and you can crawl in the frame, disappear. You can play with the frame, you know. So I did that completely copying uh, silent movies, which I adore. And Chaplin, of course, his camera moves are much more complicated. Um, but his physicality, his humor, which I don't have because I don't, I'm not so acrobatic, but even his face, his expressions, uh, um, so yes, I do, uh, he is my inspiration. So we, we speak about the frame, or you speak about the frame, and also about the, the face, the, and about silent film. And this, to me, brings together three skill sets that you offer as a result of a long career in modeling. Mm -hmm. And you said once, and this is one of the great perils, let me tell you, one of the great perils of celebrity is that you say something and then it follows you around forever. Yes. So you, you can <laughs> deny you ever said this. But at one point you did, I think, say that you preferred, rather preferred modeling to acting in yes. some ways. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because it seems quite plain in your performance in Green Porno, yes. the film, that that's the case. the case. Not that you prefer it, but that those it's skills I, I help think that you. one of the things that was easier for me in modeling is that I speak three languages, French, Italian, English, and I, um, act in three languages, but none of these three languages are my language. I mean, Italian is mostly my language, but I left Italy when I was 18 years old, so I only speak Italian mostly with my brothers and sisters. In my everyday life, I speak either French, because I'm a lot in France, and a lot of my work is financed in France, or uh, English, because I live in New York. Um, so. All these nuances that actor can have with their voice, or using accent, or saying things, words, that it, it's incredible. I, I don't have it. I'm deaf to it, because I am a foreigner to it. And, but visually, instead, I can be international. So were the silent movie. The silent movie star were international stars. They were Polish, Romanian. Then the sound came in. and. And you had to speak English, you know. And so a lot of these people disappeared because uh, they didn't. Uh, so for me, modeling was relying on visual. And I felt safer uh, because I didn't have my voice and all the mistakes that I make. And, you know, it's hard to cast me because if you, are, if you want to cast me in a family, I cannot be cast, because the entire family speaks English, and the sister has an accent. Why? What's wrong with her? What happened? So it's always a handicap, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like, if, if you could just pretend for a moment to believe that I am an extraordinarily attractive young woman <laughs> of deep self-confidence, mm -hmm. and I come to you, I have the bravery to come to you at an event, perhaps at a New York Times Luminato <laughs> event, to say, Ms. Rosalini, I am exceptionally beautiful. I am very talented. I believe I am. And I have self-confidence. I want to be an actor. What do you tell me? I'm 25. I'm 25. Well, if I'm going to give you an advice is to try to understand what is it that you love in, uh, in for example, I understood that I liked storytelling. So I can do that acting, I can do that writing, I can do that in the theater, I can do... I also like fashion and I like costume, and that is quite clear also when you see my work. Um, it's very difficult if you say, I just want to be an actor, because it may not happen, or it happened, but it, it's very difficult to make money, to, make, to really live, to have enough money, to make a living. So it's easier, a doctor can always be in production, in post-production, can write, and can also be an actor. Because acting, per se, I mean, there was a, I read it in the New York Times, an incredible it's statistic. Gotta be true. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, actually the people that belong to the um, union, SAG, only about, I think, 2% made, or 5% made anything that was above $50,000. The majority of people made below $50,000, and 80% made $5,000. Right. So you can't live with that, you know, right. of right. course. 
Um, my chances aren't good, because I'm not, I'm not that woman. Um, to return to the business of, of modeling and language and a lack of language, I want to uh, return to our friend Andy Byers, who I was speaking about yeah. before in the costumes. And another thing he told me that you said was, I, you must always be able to see my eyes. Yes. And I thought that was so important, because I mean, it's a well, duh, once you say it out loud, because your eyes are so important to those films and to the stage performance. Well, also, we read emotion in the eyes. Uh, you know, and that I really try to, I, I knew this as an actress, I knew that uh, if the camera is in the wrong angle and doesn't take the eye very well, I could be filled with emotion and the camera doesn't pick it up. Right. So, and I've seen this in films, I've seen this in performances, I've seen this on set, I've seen good directors really adjusting the light so the light, you see the eyes, or if you want to cast your eyes, then the camera is still there to, sh to, eyes show a lot of emotions, and if you don't show the eyes, you might miss the emotion. And since in, uh, in my film, it was this sort of silent movie that the camera didn't move, I, I had to make sure that the eyes were seen, because that's where... That's where the, it happens. The, that's where it happens. So there is, if you haven't seen it, in the, right as you take the squid to bed. As a squid, <laughs> it's nothing weird. But as, as the two squid, your eyes follow it out. It's really, it's pretty sexy. <laughs> Um, so we've talked about sex. We will continue to talk about sex. There's no reason to leave. But um, I'd like to take a moment to talk about another great um, human passion, food. Food, yes. Yes. Do you eat animals? I do. I still eat animals. Which is your favorite animal to eat? Uh, <laughs> I still eat animals. And you know, I'm always saying, I shouldn't eat animals. Then I say, well, of course we should eat animals, because we have been always eating animals, and animals eat us. So. Uh, there is this concept, I think that, um, I think that there is a moral issue. It isn't so much for me to eat the animal, but is how animal are treated. Right. And I think that is really an issue that I think we all became more sensitive because it was with the industrialization of food after the war that now we have this, you know, incredible, you know, billions of chickens grown in little cages where they can't even stretch their wings, or, or you know, mama pigs that they, you know, they accept, they can't lie down on their sides, or they can't turn in their cage. All this didn't exist when they were right. the small farming. So that is the kind of animals that I don't want to eat, and I try not to eat. But I have to say that I travel a lot, and so sometimes I'm given, you know, a, a, a yeah, hamburger those delta or a chicken. chickens. Or chicken. Not... I don't know where it comes from. But when I'm home, you know, the thing that I'm very hypocritical is that I might buy free-range organic chicken. I have them home, and I don't eat mine because I know them personally, and I haven't gathered yet the courage to eat the one I know personally. You eat their eggs. I eat their eggs, but I don't but you eat have them yet. yet. To chop. Yeah, I have to. That is my. I have to do that. If I eat chicken, then I have to eat my chicken. Well, it sounds um, like those chickens have lived for a little while, so that'll be some coco vin. Yeah. You, you let the wine really cook it down. <laughs> could Could you do me the great pleasure of describing a perfect meal, a perfect uh, home meal? Oh. Well, you know, I, uh, I used to have an apartment in New York, and New York has become increasingly expensive. Only, not only the apartment, but just the taxes, the maintenance, the charges, the common charges. And so I sold my apartment in New York. Also, my children are grown up. I have two children, a daughter and a son. And so the apartment felt so empty without them. I was so sad. So I sold the apartment. And with the money of a small two-bedroom apartment in New York, I bought an entire farm an hour and a half from New York, where I now work with Patty Gentry, who used to be a chef, but now has become a farmer. And we are doing a, a farm to table. We are doing, we're mostly working with Andrew Tarlow, who in New York has several restaurants in Brooklyn. So this is a whole new adventure. And it's wonderful to work with them. I mean, it's wonderful to eat the, fo the food that you know you know as, as a seed, and then it grows, and then you eat it, and then you have the chef that prepares it perfectly. And Andrew's restaurant, the menu is very limited. He might have you know, four or five things, because he's seasonal vegetable, and most of them are ours. But of course, he has other farms that are providing the food. 
And so that, is, to me, has become a, a delicious way of eating, because also there is so much history, and there is nothing better than see the plant growing, and uh, it's really fantastic. Saving Long Island from further development is a good thing. Yes, it is. You are yes. involved in a number of conservation efforts. Yes. You're involved in um, some animal efforts as, as well. well would you describe yourself as an activist, or no, is that I'm an not American an activist. No. construction? You know, I mean, we were talking about, you know, something happens to me. me. Me as a journalist, maybe you can give me the answer. I don't know if, you know, one of the questions I was always asked when I gave interviews at the end, the most polite journalist would say, I am sorry, I really have to ask this question. I hate to do it, but the reader would like to know, do you have somebody in your life? Yeah. Now, they don't ask that anymore. Now, I don't know that if they don't ask this because I am too old. <laughs> and they don't ask for that reason. But there is another question that is gravely strange in the last 10 years, which is, how do you give back? Ah. And it's all of a sudden, in America, there is this assumption right. that if you are successful in your work, it's not enough to pay taxes. Now yeah. you have to give more back. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's right. Noblesse oblige. Uh, noblesse oblige. Uh, yes, I agree with you. And there is this as aspect of um, uh, fundraising or give uh, donors that it's almost like uh, noblesse. And that part I don't like. You know? yeah. We'll help the people that don't know how to do it. We'll tell you. We'll help. I hate that part. So I'm not an activist well, let me at tell you all. Something. That's a very American part. That part that, of, that the, of, we'll of help you how out. do you, we'll help you out. Yeah, yes, you but poor it's, little uh, well, schmuck. Yes, else, yeah. exactly. Well, there yeah. is, it is a little bit. And so I don't, I don't feel an activist. Of course, I, I, you know, so who am I giving money? So I'm giving money to my local cinema, art movie theater that we started in my village, showing foreign films. I give, uh, I bought my land um, because I, took it away from a developer, but I didn't take it away from my developer. It's my neighbor, and she got discouraged because of the, uh, we all hated that she was going to build 12 homes, but she said, I'd sell it to you for less money because I'm going to lose money, and because of the economy, I cannot build home. Why don't, why don't you do something with it? And I said, hey, what, what do you want me to do? I, if I can do a farm, she said, she's a lawyer. She said, I think you could do a farm. So we <laughs> went together to talk to Suffolk County Authority, and so we did the farm. I mean, I did the farm. And it's an organic farm. It's, it's an organic farm, yes. Not easy. So No, it's not easy. No, and More expensive, the operation and all that. Then I give money occasionally to um, animal research, you know, to especially uh, wild animals. My, my latest donation was to elephant because, of course, uh, it's, I can't conceive that the world would not have elephants, you know. Of course, there's a lot of animals that are dying, but the idea that elephants, uh, babar, you know, uh, Dumbo, I mean, it, in one generation, they're gone? It can't be. So I gave a big donation to young Douglas Hamilton. All right, then. And of course, you, you do help out a lot of animals. I've spoken to some of your neighbors on Long Island. They describe a scene of, they describe, there are a lot of animals, they're pigs. Oh, yeah, no, but the pigs, you oh, know, but yeah, the pigs. The, the, See, this is no, the, the thing. No, the animal that I dogs. do seriously is dogs. Okay, but the, so the pigs aren't serious? That's a, that's a side uh, thing? No, well, there are pigs. a neighbor, she started to do a pig farm, but she's not <laughs> doing it right, I think. Uh, <laughs> she's going to have too many pigs, and she doesn't have enough land. You know, I said, there is a, a scientist have a calculation of how much acre you have per animal, for the animal to be happy. And well, there are studies. Uh, so you have to be careful. So I bought two pigs. And I See? gave them a whole acre. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't have the courage to eat them. So now they are old fat, and they are <laughs> occupying a whole acre. And sometimes they follow me. Of course, they love me. Of course, me, they, so love they you. follow me with my dog. <laughs> Thank you for sparing me. <laughs> I didn't want to die. Um, tell, tell us about the dogs. So the dogs, uh, a few years ago, I was in the theater, and I went to dinner with the actor that was working with me, and his wife was coming to join us, and she came out of the subway with a huge dog, a Labrador. I said, how do you take a Labrador on the subway? I, didn't, uh, didn't you get arrested? And she said, oh, no, no. I'm volunteering from the Guide Dog Foundation, and I raise dog puppies 
for them. I keep them for a year, and I have a little uh, permit to take the dog to the restaurant, to the subway, because you mimic for them the life that they are going to have with the blind people, because the dog has to become habituated to it. So I said, oh, I have to do that. And so Linda Larkin, who is the actress, by the way, she's the voice of Princess Yasmin in the cartoon. <laughs> Linda and I have raised 10 guide dogs oh, together. Wow. And now I also have mama dogs coming to my home, very pregnant, and have all the litter. So that is, you know, I had uh, I, well, whelping, it's called. I had, you know, 10 whelpings. Uh, constantly have guide dogs all, coming. All of Labradors? They're mostly Labradors. They are golden retrievers, sometimes a mixed golden lab. Sometimes they experiment with new breeds. You know, I have. Uh, I adopted one of the dogs that I raised but didn't make it. Um, that is a mix of Labrador poodle. Ah, uh, the, yeah. the Labrador. Uh, doodle, yeah. But, did, but they didn't work, so they discontinued uh, but that you, so you combination. But so you kept it. He's out with the pigs. Yes, he's out with the pigs. Uh, yes. <laughs> no restaurants, but on the other hand, I'm not responsible for whether that light is red or green either, <laughs> says, says the Labradoodle. Um, <laughs> let us return to, to green for a moment. Uh, there's, the, there's a moment at the beginning where you say that what is about to happen is not pornographic. Yes. Right? No one believes it at first, but then it's not pornographic. You say, eh, maybe it's obscene, maybe it's erotic, depending on your taste, but it's, <laughs> it's not going to be pornographic. And I thought, to return to your eyes for a moment, in the very moment where you said that, I believe her. I believe her implicitly. That I know exactly what is, or I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but I know that this is not going to be titillation that follows. Mm -hmm. So the audience, I, trusted you implicitly. And this reminded me of a story that my mother told me about you. And it's a story that is taken from, um, you may not remember this, the memorial service for Gregor von Rezzori. Yes. In 98 oh, yes. or 99. Yes, I'm Were just going to Italy to have the centennial of Gregor von Rezzori. Yes. The writer. Yeah. OK. So be. this great writer. And there's this memorial service, and people stand up to speak. And he's you know, compared to Nabokov, which is true, Thomas Mann. He's yeah. talk about his films. And it's, it's, it's pretty great. Stuff. Yeah. And then, now, here's my mom in an email. And then this beautiful woman stood up to say just a few words about my friend. And her main point was this. She'd noticed that children and dogs always trusted Grisha, as he was known, took to him, preferred him to the other adults in the room. She thought this was a surefire signal of his basic humanity and kindness. And then she sat down. Drop dead Magnificent. <laughs> that's my mom. Oh, that's so sweet. So, can you, I, I, I think that's probably true. We know instantly, as I knew instantly, I can trust this woman on the stage. <laughs> can you talk about how our relationships with children, with dogs, yeah. um, reflect on who we are as people? Uh, this is a leading question. We're getting to Darwin. Yeah, we're getting to Darwin. Uh, yes, uh, I don't know, Jean-Claude Carrière, he would have answered better this question than I. Because um, I don't feel like I'm a philosopher or a scientist. Uh, but of course, you know, I just recently, because I went back to university to finish my master's degree on, on animal behavior and etology, and the, the, course, the last course I took is on communication. And how, so for me as an actress, it was phenomenal, because of course, actors do communicate. We have to express emotion to, and the words almost don't count. You know, the, you, you learn the text by heart, but if you don't color it with your emotion, you know, that's my responsibility is not the words, it's how to color them. So it was really interesting to study, to read about these scientists that study these incredible, mysterious cues uh, that they are in communication. And so I think that children and animals who are maybe not yet completely con conditioned by formality, language, can read through it faster. Uh, so can always know better. You know, my chickens too. My chickens, I tell you a story. When I got my chicken first, I was surprised to see that either me or my housekeeper, uh, Margarito is a man, uh, would feed them. But Margarito always said to me, hmm, that one looked very fat. I'm going to eat that one. <laughs> but I think the chicken understood it, because when Margarito fed them, they went very far away. He had to distribute the grain, and they came. When I came, they all came to me, because they knew that 
I wasn't going to eat them. You know, yeah. I couldn't eat them. And, and they read something in our attitude, in the way we looked at it. They read that Margarito was a predator. <laughs> I think they did. They may also have spoken to the pigs. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's time for another pop quiz, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Are you game? What's your favorite time of day? Early morning. Beautiful. What's the last thing you watched on either a small screen or a large screen? The last thing, uh, like that you today, saw, yeah, that today, I saw, uh, it could be CNN. Yes, I think it was the news this morning. Yeah. I led, I led her, I led the answer. Yeah. <laughs> Terrible. What's the last book you read? Uh, the last uh, book I read is uh, I forgot the name. is about uh, uh, a scientist who worked with chimpanzee that they were taught sign language because chimpanzee they don't have. Uh, vocal cords like ours, so they can't speak, but they understand English quite well if they are staying in captivity. So they taught them sign language and they communicate quite a lot. And this is a scientist who has followed them and followed also the terrible story of some of them that, you know, they are in an experiment for 10 years or 15 years, but of course they live 60 years. And how, you know, so it was a beautiful book about not only language and trying to, it's almost like E.T., you know, like, uh, like <laughs> that moment. The bridging the divide. Bridging the divide and also our cruelty uh, because bridging the divide meant captivity, meant that this animal didn't have another place to go after the experiment. Um, and so this uh, man sacrificed his life to, 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 to make their life, to continue their life uh, talking to him and playing games. They, they understood English very well. They watched TV. The chimpanzee was very entertained. They it's all had a TV line. set. Yeah. It was very touching, yeah. Who's your favorite literary character? Oh, my favorite literary character, uh, I think. I read very few ro novels. Uh, uh, probably, I think that I read all the Garcia Marquez, so somebody Diablo. in Garcia Marquez, yes. <laughs> the magic. Yes. What is your favorite luxury? Favorite hotels. I okay. love luxurious hotel. I love them. What defines a luxurious hotel most for you? Uh, well, I think quiet, mm -hmm. cleansiness, and wonderful spa. You could stay at the hotel all day because there is something be beautiful food, beautiful spa. So, you know, I have to exercise because I have a bad back. And if you have a beautiful spa, I, I could stay there for two hours. If the spa is sad, 15 minutes, and then I say, oh, you know, I, I think go. I have to send an email. Oh, I have to. <laughs> OK, so I have some questions that I elicited from the World Wide Web. We're going to come back to your questions, which will be fascinating. But I'm intrigued by what happens out in the great anonymity of, of the web. The web. Yes. It's terrifying. There were a lot of <laughs> questions for you. I, 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 frankly, I, I couldn't use most of them. Um, it's a. <laughs> It's really a dirty world out there. Um, here's one. You are so good on television. Is there a reason why you don't do more? Uh, like on tele television? Yes, like a any, series. Uh, why? Well, you know, OK, here, this is what happened to my acting. Uh, I don't really watch much television series, though I do know that there are some that are very, very good. Uh, partly, I don't know how to download them on my computer. I do again. Phone rings. I, you know, it, <laughs> so it's uh, uh, so it's not that they are no good, but I don't see them so much. So it's hard to be in something that you don't feel you're part of as mm -hmm. an audience, because uh, uh, you're not in love with it. You're not in love with what you're doing. Also, it became terribly demanding. I've been in a few um, as a guest. The hours are very, very long, 16, 17 hours a day. And that was partially what made me feel uh, I didn't want to be an actress anymore, because it, was, it took so much of my time away from my children. And uh, the conflict of, of being a mom and working became so strong let alone that every time you do a film, you have to do the red carpets, the million interviews. The demands are enormous. And also, in films, most of the time, I'm asked, I think, not anymore, because now I play a worm. So I, <laughs> I killed that. But they always try to, 
they, there was a path for me, maybe a few years ago, that I could be the woman that was aging gracefully. <laughs> and I thought that was so boring, yeah. you know, that I thought I'd, I'd be a worm, I'd be a, a spider. That's much more fun, you know, <laughs> than just being this thing that if it's old, is gracious, or still defeats uh, uh, aging. Because I, I haven't defeated aging, I'm aging, you know. So I don't know, I found it to be so uninteresting. So that's one reason why I didn't dwell into that world. It doesn't mean that if a wonderful series came, it's along. Going, came along, I wouldn't do it. But do that world of red car. You know, there is a lot that comes to trying to be popular so that your, the producer hire you. Nowadays, they ask actors to come with a very long list in Twitter and uh, uh, Facebook, oh. uh, you know, because you bring in your fan. Uh, that I can't do. We're all doing that. We're all tweeting at, at Sam Sifton. Um, <laughs> different, uh, different direction. This is a good question. Roadrunner or Bugs Bunny? Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, both of them. But Roadrunner is so funny. You know, I like the coyote that gets always beaten Wiley. up. Uh, yes, yeah. I like that one so much. But you know, a car, Jack Jones, is a great genius of cinema. One of the great geniuses. Did you watch some cartoons as you thought Constantly, about this? Constantly, I still do. Yeah. Cartoons also have an enormous influence in my film. I love cartoons. It's, yeah. Because it needs to be very simple. I mean, I know it, that there's a It needs a one... to be simple and colorful. And, uh, and of course, Jack Jones is also is not, there is no, is not sentimental. Right. And I don't want to be sentimental because, see, Disney is sentimental. I love Disney, too. But it's sentimental, not Bugs Bunny, right. not the Coyote. And so I like that humor better. I love that answer. <laughs> and what language do you dream? You know, I think I dream in the three languages I speak. I spoke uh, them since, although I learned English when I was uh, an adolescent, but uh, I spoke French and Italian growing up. And so I think I, when I dream of people, I tend to speak one language with certain people and another language with others. And so it's like reality. It's all mixed, these three languages. Um, we spoke a little bit earlier about how green pornos as a, as a film series was meant to, see, to be seen perhaps on a, on a second screen or yeah. a third screen or a fourth screen. And I'm wondering now that, and then when I saw it again last night, but as a stage play, they blow up very well. Yes. Um, because you're very beautiful <laughs> and very good at your job. But also because the, the, it, the expansion of the image works. There's no degradation of, mm -hmm. of the quality of, of the message that's being sent. But do you think those second and third and fourth and potentially fifth screens are changing art itself? Yes. When, I mean, when, we, when Robert Redford, that I said he's such a fantastic person, Redford not only is a superstar, he's very handsome, he's a director, he's a producer, but he is one of the most avant-garde filmmaker that ever existed. And mm -hmm. he's given back to cinema, not only the best, among the best Hollywood film, but also the tradition, American tradition of independent film that he fostered at Sundance, and not only the festival, but the institute and all that. And partially also gives money to do experimental film. And in fact, it was Redford that gave me the money to start Green Porno. And uh, the idea, we did Green Porno, my first series on, uh, on short, is two minutes film on animals, even before the iPhone existed. It was about to come out, and mm -hmm. Redford had the idea that maybe the iPhone would be would need content, and it would be content. It would be different than television and cinema. So we talked about cinema as the first screen, television as the second screen, and uh, the the third screen was actually your computer at home. But the, the iPhone was going to be the fourth screen and would have a complete new programming. And so we studied short films because YouTube just started it, and short film became very popular. He was very enthusiastic because. At the beginning of cinema, short films were very popular and then disappeared. And then we studied the colors, you know, the, 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 the sharp imagery, because in a small screen you can't see a depth, much of a depth of field. So all that was done to create content for the iPhone, thinking that the iPhone was going to be 
completely different. Nowadays, it, it, the reality six months, six years later, or seven years later, is that it, people watch it on a big screen, on television, on their right. iPhone, on their iPad. So the screen doesn't matter. But I think as, as a storyteller for the clarity, you cannot make any more the John Ford beautiful you know, shot of uh, Utah with one little horse coming like this. Because in case you see it on an iPhone, you well, don't know boy. what's happening, right. you know? <laughs> so, of course, director, they have to adjust uh, to the fact that their film are going to be seen uh, in different canvases. Do you think that that will lead inexorably back to cartoons, or...? Well, you know, cartoons, that's why green porno looks like cartoons, you know, because when we looked at uh, Walt Disney, on a big screen, on a small screen, it looked always beautiful, and it didn't change. But if you look at The Godfather on a big screen, you are completely taken. On television, still some. On the iPhone, nothing. Al Pacino <laughs> is not scary. <laughs> <laughs> Should we take a few questions yeah, from this audience? Yeah. Um, the way we're going to do this, I've been um, instructed by our corporate overlords that you got to go and line up by these microphones. I am mic'd, she is mic'd, you must be mic'd, so that our friends watching at home on their iPhones can hear you. <laughs> so if you can just stand up there in this aisle here and this aisle here, we can take a couple questions. Or we. Ha! I'll answer anything you want. <laughs> anyway, why don't you slide over there, man? Let's see how we do. Oh, and keep them brief so we can get a few in. Hi. Hi. Well, I have so many questions, but I'm going to ask just one. Yeah. Um, okay, this, my question is, if you will have a chance to pick a timeline, which one you will, which one you will pick and why? Why? I think that being a woman, I think I would live right now when Hillary Clinton might become the president. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't live <laughs> when we didn't have votes, when we couldn't have bank account, where we couldn't own property, and when we still had to wear corsets. <laughs> mm -mm. No, this is a good time for women. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so glad to have this opportunity to see you in person. <laughs> Given your interest in animals and your interest in storytelling and the fact that fairy tales are so populated with animals, what were your favorite fairy tales as a child and what stories were your favorites to tell your own children? Do you know, I often looked at fairy tale or uh, Esopo. How do you pronounce it in English? Uh, the Greek writer Esop? Esop. 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 Uh, or La Fontaine, you know. And I. I always get slightly irritated because they never write about the animal itself. They always human. They are always human, you know. In the sh they take the form of a, you know an ant or a turtle, but they're not animals. And I think that has been our mistake for many years. I mean, we lived with animals from the time we appeared in this planet, and. Uh, I think hunters understand animals, then their behavior, probably um, people that work with animals in agriculture. But we have lost completely the understanding of an animal. And, now, and it seems to me sometimes that storytelling or these writers used animal. They didn't tell the story about animal. Because I tried to tell, you know, to start the story of, um, you know, once, I, it's never going to happen. I wanted to do the real Mickey Mouse and tell about <laughs> rats uh, to or maybe mouse having vaginal plugs because the male, you know, they excrete, is, is uh, you know, about, then you tell Mickey yeah, Mouse, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, the boy. real Mickey Mouse. Uh, <laughs> or, you know, Jiminy the cricket, how is the cricket uh, mating or what would he do? I think that would be great fun. So I read them, but uh, it was more fun than nature. <laughs> Let's go across here. Ciao Isabella e benvenuta a Toronto, un gran piacere. Um, I just wanted to know, as, as a fellow Roman, I know you were born in Rome, but I'm just wondering, there's an honesty to your, to your acting, and I'm wondering if that's influenced your acting and your modeling, that kind of sort of dramatic, in the moment way of being that Italians have. Yeah. Well, I think that all actors try to be in that moment, you know, that it is essential to, to acting. Though, there are different ways to be in the moment, to be authentic on screen. Um, 
My father, for example, worked with non-actors because he believed that if you need a fisherman, you better take a fisherman. He looked like a fisherman. He would move his hands on the nets like professionally. And if you get Cary Grant to play a fisherman, you'll see that he's an actor pretending to be. So my father liked non-actors. And then, you know, talking about Cary Grant, he's almost like always Cary Grant. Yeah. In, you know, whether he's the king or the cook, uh, he's always Cary Grant. You know, I like love Cary Grant. So there's a different ways of being actors. Uh, uh, and Hollywood might have more the star. And the star never changes. And the European tradition, instead, the star disappears into its role. So I don't know which one I belong to, but the being in the moment is both. Both, don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi. I'm just wondering, um, does your fascination and passion for, the, uh, for biology and zoology, has it ever led you to the world of microscopic creatures? Oh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, some, some microscopic creatures, cre not really so small that you need a microscope, but, you know, little things that you, you know, I always had. Uh, a jewelry designer gave me one of these loops that they look at the diamond, but I looked at uh, insect. And I always had it in my purse because even in the most boring moments, there is always a fly, something <laughs> dead that you can look at. Uh, so I, it fascinated me, but then I lost it. Uh, and I, you know, it, it, I got so much entertainment out of that. You know, a long dinner. Uh, there was always a fly <laughs> yeah. that dropped dead, and you oh, can look, look at it. A bed bug. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I thought I heard in your presentation today at Green Porno, there's such an undercurrent, um, sort of a social undercurrent about tolerance, diversity, uh, acceptance of multisexuality, all of that seems to be such a strong message, yes. uh, apart from just the sort of... Uh, you know, animal yes. interest. It, 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 it wasn't intended, but you know, the few um, Sundance, I did most of my film for Robert Redford Sundance, and at a certain point a few years ago, Sundance said to me, does homosexuality exist in animals? Because we're doing a programming on homosexuality, and it'd be nice to have a short film addressing this. So a book came out that was called Sexual Exuberance that just came out and was actually, um, uh, collecting data from 450 species where homosexuality had been seen. And it was collected by scientists, because the, the, the scientist has given out the order to say, you know, take this data. So I read that book, and it was perfect for Sundance. And so we did do the dolphin, the, the deer with deer, because we found all these animals. This deer. And, and so it became very interesting to me. And it was the first time that I saw uh, I mean, the beginning, it was only animals are so strange, are so fascinating. And then when it came to homosexuality, there was a parallel. I could see that our culture created a, a biases, you know, that uh, probably we gave, um, we gave the act of lovemaking, the mounting, for example, of deer, we gave them a too restrictive uh, meaning. We thought it was for reproduction. Probably it's used for other things. It's used also to create bonds or to create hierarchy. And so, um, and so probably it is for us. We don't make love only to reproduce. We know that. Yes. So we do it also to create bonds, to create who knows what else. So we gave them a two, uh, we made a mistake and then condemned all the others saying, oh, you're doing it against nature, but it exists in nature. So Thank that's you. why that became, it, it filtered in my monologue. But in an entirely apolitical way. It's not, you, there's no lecture about, no, no. It, which I think it, it makes it all the more effective. Okay. Speaking as a critic of dolphin shows. <laughs> Thank I got you. a treatise on Flipper I can show you later. Yes. Hi, Isabella. Nice, it's a pleasure to see you. You're very well spoken. Um, I'm just curious because most people imagine, you know, fame, right? And you've fame. Been fa fame, fame, being fame, famous, fame, famous, yeah. Because you've been famous since you were quite young, right? And traveling, you know, with your father, my and your, parents, yes. And I'm just curious, um, maybe you could give us a walk through what it's like to be famous. Maybe the pros, the advantages of being famous, and maybe some of the disadvantages, because okay. I'm under the under understanding it's probably about yes. fifty-fifty. That's what Marlon Brando was saying. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, I. I 
as a little girl, I, I, you know, I didn't know any different. I thought my parents were famous because they were parents. I thought, by the, you're, if you're a parent, you're famous, you know. And then I understood, no, no, my parents are famous. But I remember going to school and ask um, my friends, but how famous is my mom? Can you tell me, is she famous like Joan Crawford or Greta Garbo? Give me a sense of how famous she is. Because I, I couldn't, you know, I needed a thermometer of fame. But for me, she was mama. I didn't understand how famous she was, you know. So you learn all this growing up. Uh, the thing that was annoying, uh, and I felt very protective of my parents, especially my mom, because directors are not followed by paparazzi. And they can enjoy their private life much more than actors. Actors and actresses, everybody knows their face. And if you see Angelina Jolie in the streets, immediately oh, there is a thousand photographer, but also you're growing up with your, with your phone and you put it in your Facebook. So there is, a, and that was also, they didn't exist as social media then, but my mom was like this. And I always felt very, very protective because mama wanted so much to have a, a normal life and being able to walk and pick us up at school. She can never do it, you know, or, or we had to prepare the thing because there were crowd following. And so that part, I always felt protective of her. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I was really intrigued and heartened when you described the way in which you chose to step back a little bit, not completely, from your professional work uh, in light of the relationship you wanted to have with your children. Yes. And there's a lot of dialogue right now, and I think uh, in North America, Sheryl Sandberg has really shifted that with her book Lean In yes. to kind of say, well, women should just stay at work and try harder. And it's really a, a, a vexing and vexed issue. And I'm wondering if a woman who was 25 or 30 came to you and said, what, what should I do? This is such a mess. Yeah. Uh, what would you tell her? Well, I don't know, you know, I, I think I told my 25 years old uh, uh, friend, you know, I, we did part of the battle, and part of the battle was for women to become doctor, to become lawyer, to become president. Uh, but what we haven't done yet is to bring the family in, in the working place. You know, I, uh, as an actress, sometimes I was told not to let my producer know that I was married or I had children because of fear they have to dream of you as available or fear that, uh, you know, my child had a fever and I would catch a plane and go back to home to check how they were. So, you know, I think that uh, though women enter the men's world, the men have to win enter the women's world. And maybe one day there will be less conflict. Because for women of my generation who had career and, uh, and family, that has been the hardest. It was to bring harmony in these two things. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hi there. It's an honor to like, watch you speak in person. I was wondering, with your family being in the film industry and you having such a long career as well, what stories do you think you would still like to see or doesn't get told as often? What story? Uh, in films? Yeah, so? what, kind of, what kind of story? Oh, eh, well, there are so many stories that can be told, you know. Uh, it's interesting, actually, it's interesting that we have narratives. This is one of the big questions. Do animals, if they have languages and they understood, like I said, chimpanzee understand, like you know, twelve-year-olds, uh, human, uh, do they have narratives? This is one of the things that it has been studied. It might be, you know, we women, we we we, we hu women and men, human, we always try to set ourselves apart from animals. We always say, what is makes us human, better, superior? And now they know it is not tool making, it is maybe less and less uh, language, but maybe we are hoping narrative. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> but so many stories. <laughs> well, if narrative ends up as our religion and guiding principle, I think we'll be okay. <laughs> it will be okay, I yes. Think so. Isabella Rossellini, thank, thank you so you. much for talking thank to you. us today. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.